to everyone. All right, up next, um, we're going to have a keynote panel, 5G and the Intelligent Edge Unleashing the Potential. And uh, Paul Berryman is going to be moderating the keynote. So hi, hi Paul. Um, and let me just uh, introduce Paul briefly. Hi there. Um, so until January this year, Paul was Group Chief Technology Officer of PCCW and HKT in Hong Kong, where he led the group's product and technology roadmap and strategic development for almost 20 years. Amongst many things, Paul is currently non-executive director at Spark New Zealand, sorry, Spark in New Zealand and Raid Networks in South Africa. All right, Paul, over to you and the panel. Thank you, Roy. Uh, welcome everyone to this panel discussion on 5G and the Intelligent Edge. Um, we'll be discussing a number of issues surrounding this topic, uh, including uh, thoughts about 5G and edge opportunities and how operators are leveraging this. Also the role of automation, how we're enhancing customer experience and how operators see the value chain evolving and the role of the telco today in this ecosystem. So today discussing this, we have Hira Gupta, who is president of network and service operations at Reliance Geo. We have Zaif uh, Siddiqui, who is the executive director and global head of 5G and, and IoT enterprise business in NTT Docomo. And we have Vishnu Ban, the uh, director of 5G customer engagement at Singtel and Konstantin Polykronopoulos, uh, who is the VP of 5G and Telco Cloud at Juniper Networks. So um, let's get started. Maybe with some, a couple of quick warm-up questions, and uh, let's start with Hira. Uh, you guys at Reliance Geo have done a great job with your massive uh, 4G rollout. Can you tell us briefly where you are with 5G? Yeah, uh, thanks, Paul. Uh, uh, currently, we all operators in India have got the trial spectrum. And the trial spectrum is being used uh, for uh, technology validation as well as for uh, you know coverage validation and uh, 5g sa core uh, uh, kind of uh, iot testing so we are putting up in multiple cities in uh, you know various geographies dense urban rural and uh, semi-urban kind of areas and that's the you know stage where we are in and uh, you know uh, the trials uh, will be over in a few weeks time and then we may you know uh, kind of uh, uh, finalize the final rollout plans and back end the infrastructure upgrade backhaul upgrade all those activities are also being taken up by various operators like uh, uh, penetrating more and more fiber into the existing 4g sites which is a kind of must for uh, any 5g network so this is the stage where we are and the 5g spectrum auction uh, is uh, due i think anytime uh, next year maybe in the current uh, uh, fiscal final last quarter or uh, you know whatever depends upon the government uh, schedule for the auction so then uh, you know operators will kind of uh, acquire spectrum and go for uh, 5g rollout that's where we are well, thank you here and, and good luck with the auctions i i hate the things but anyway yeah um Ziv, most operators have been totally focused on consumer 5G. Where, where's NTT Docomo? Have you gotten past that stage and getting down to the real reasons for 5G, which are really B2B and massive IoT applications and some industry-specific solutions? Well, thank you, Paul. Uh, it has been over. Yeah, it has been over uh, 18 months uh, since we launched the 5G as it has been commercialized. And our area is expanding, of course, in the consumer market. Uh, we expect to have about 20,000 base stations ready with 5G with the sub-6 uh, sub uh, spectrum by 2022, end of March. And I hope uh, Docomo would be achieving, uh, uh, reaching 70% of the population uh, by 2023 uh, to deliver 5G uh, services. Coming to your point around massive IoT and industry-specific solutions, uh, the massive IoT thing, uh, this is still, I think, uh, in, in progress. Uh, it's not something that has been ready yet, I would say. Uh, with the 3GPP standards for, you know, the release 18, uh, 17 and 18 yet to come, uh, we are also working uh, within Docomo to see how we can work uh, on the MMTC part. But talking about the industry-specific uh, solutions, uh, which is the core area of my job with the enterprise sales, uh, we are working with many verticals, uh, including entertainment, broadcasting, medical, uh, mobility areas, and smart factories. Uh, we have numerous cases already, uh, for example, within the manufacturing, for example, where, where, whereby we are replacing uh, Wi-Fi services with uh, 5G capability. 
And this could allow uh, the industry specific solutions of, for example, allowing manufacturers to have uh, remove the cablings that they have, uh, allow them to create uh, assembly layouts as they wish. And these are some things that we are working uh, as of now. But we also must consider not just the uh, public network, but also the private network. Uh, how are we going to uh, provide private 5G as well? Uh, in Japan, uh, operators are not allocated the license for 5G, uh, for the private 5G. So we have to work with our partners. And that's why, for example, we have embarked on the mission to creating a 5G consortium uh, in Thailand, where we know that there are a, lot, a huge amount of especially Japanese manufacturers and other multinational manufacturers. And we want to work together with them to see how we can deliver the value of private 5G there as well. well thank you. Thank you. I, I know that, that uh, Vishnu Singtel have also been doing quite a bit of work on, uh, on uh, smart city and other things. So uh, have you had to make many changes to your organization to accommodate the industry skills and solutions needed for massive IoT? Or smart city applications and you know, what special skills are needed for a telco i think from a skilling perspective the good thing about singapore is that you know the government is probably more focused on skilling than even the corporate uh, you know uh, world so there's been a, there's been a lot of uh, focus which has been through skills sg as we call it you know as a program which subsidizes uh, the cost of upskilling employees both in the public and the private sector and uh, what we have seen is that you know it has evolved an actual ecosystem of uh, institutions as well as uh, innovation centers which are focused on not just uh, upskilling the people who are a part of this 5G revolution in the sense the providers, but also the consumers. Uh, 5G in our uh, view is very different from the previous worlds of 2G, 3G, 4G, because the impact here is actually going to be on the industry and not so much you know, on the telcos. I mean, it uh, probably you know, four-fifth of the impact is directly on the industry on account of you know, what 5G can deliver. So uh, a lot of focus that we have is also on upskilling the uh, ecosystem of uh, enterprises and making them uh, you know, uh, capable enough of harnessing uh, 5G, which includes training their developers to create edge-based services, you know, migrating previous services, also looking at putting uh, uh, cloud, uh, uh, public cloud-based services to the telco edge. So it's, a, it's an all-round effort. And I think, uh, you know, uh, it's probably going to take some time before uh, people come up the curve. But, uh, but where Singapore is right now, I think it's much better place than the region uh, around us. And that's also becoming a reason why a lot of uh, services which are being uh, incubated, curated within Singapore are now being rolled out regionally to our associates in Thailand, Indonesia, even our subsidiary in Australia. Well, that, that, that's great. I mean, I'm really pleased to see a government embracing 5G because really it's, uh, it is the fabric of a, going to be the fabric of a, of a smart city. And uh, I, I think the one thing that, that I really um, regret seeing in, in, in other places is the, the fact that uh, they have these auctions where they want to raise raise money for Spectrum, and then at the same time, at the end of the day, it's those governments that are going to benefit most from five G. Mm. And uh, it's it's a strange situation, anyway. Um, yeah. Uh, so, um, Constantine, uh, given the end to end service based architecture of five G, what areas do you see Juniper Networks getting involved with in five G? Uh, elements of the open RAN virtualized core automation, network slicing, edge compute, perhaps? All of the above, Paul. Thank you uh, um, for the opportunity to, uh, to share here our views. Uh, actually, all of the above, right? So uh, a key to, um, I was uh, listening to the previous speaker, a uh, key to the success of 5G, I think, is going to be our ability to bring out uh, the, the, the concept of network slicing and make it consumable. Uh, uh, by primarily by the businesses, by the enterprise space, uh, the verticals, but also by consumers, right? Uh, I can foresee, um, you know, a marketplace for uh, network slicing where consumers can subscribe to a specific network slice, uh, potentially with, um, you know, specific services and certainly a strong SLA and pay separately, you know, for that. Uh, so network slicing, uh, in, in our view, is central to the success of 5G and beyond. Uh, and to be able to realize network slicing, you need to really look at the big picture. How do you bring uh, together what I call the three semantic domains, the radio, the transport, the many islands of transport, and the core, 
uh, as well as the data network, whether that's on-prem or on uh, hyperscalers, on high, you know, uh, public clouds, you need to bring all of that together and deliver the strong SLA, right? So automation, orchestration, visibility, 360 visibility, and most importantly, the ability to realize a closed loop uh, mitigation, auto mitigation, automation that is driven by, you know, uh, AM, you know, AI, ML based uh, capabilities is going to be central to the success. And at Juniper, we are, you know, leading in the contributions of, uh, uh, open, uh, of Oran, uh, we chair uh, working group one, uh, we're the editors of the use cases, and we make, as I said, major contributions there. Uh, we believe very much in the Oran journey, um, and it's great to see more than 300 members, uh, including pretty much all major telcos, being part of this effort to standardize how uh, the software-driven radio is going to, 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 to really be the catapult of, of uh, unleashing the power of 5G. Thanks, Constantine. Hira, connectivity is actually only one part of the solution in 5G, I think. Uh, and I think some of the statistics I've shown, or some of the, the analysis I've, I've, I've seen, um, is if let's say connectivity is, is one times the value or the revenue of the whole, the whole value chain, uh, industry applications and solutions can be somewhere like seven to 10 times the value of the chain. Does, uh, does the operators have to change in this and how, how can you get further into that value chain? What, what, what can we do to get into the, uh, the value chain more? Yeah, so uh, for what I feel that uh, see intelligent age uh, combines the computing power, AI technology, data analytics, and the advanced connectivity to quickly uh, react and act on the data, which is much closer to the uh, you know, place where it is captured. So what I feel, the, just bare connectivity will not help. Low latency connectivity, reliable connectivity, as well as the high speed connectivity to the all the G node Bs and the um, macro and ODSCs and small cells, indoor small cells is going to be the key here. All the applications which are going to be used for low latency, the CDN has to be as the age. And for making that happen, I mean, as, as uh, Constantine uh, talked about, the slicing and uh, the across the network, uh, the capability has to be built, whether it is in transport network or in radio access network or in core or in IP network. With all that, the connectivity is going to be an intelligent connectivity. And then only it is, is it, it is going to enable the uh, use cases. See, 5G is not just voice, video and data. It is all about the applications and the application have, are ranging beyond telecom connectivity, just uh, uh, to agriculture, to healthcare, to automotive, to industrial uh, manufacturing, you name. And, and everybody is struggling, even all operators who have launched, how to monetize 5G in such a way that it creates new value streams. It brings in so many system integrators, so many application providers, and the age and cloud uh, you know, partners to enable those services. If I, if I just you know, mention some of the you know, big uh, constituents like hyperscale cloud companies, IT companies, and telcos, who are expanding beyond data centers to the age network to get the most benefit coming out of the uh, incoming data. Like intelligent age, this is not going to be just a replacement of hyperscale uh, cloud data centers, but a way to distribute tasks uh, uh, across the network based upon timeline, connectivity, and security. So I would say, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, if you, if you just, uh, you know, put a right analogy here, uh, cloud and age are like brain and nerve, uh, you know, to the whole, whole ecosystem. And uh, if one of them stops working or if they do not orchestrate well, we are not going to have good outcome or good monetization uh, plans in the system. So this will be my view, Paul. Uh, thank, thanks, Hira. Um, to follow on from that, um, maybe, maybe Zayf, um, has all this, this hype that we've seen around uh, uh, blundered the edge itself? Uh, should telcos leave the edge to public cloud providers? Or is, is there still plenty of opportunity for telcos to deliver their own profitable services? Well, you see, Paul, uh, number one, I, have, I, I think we need to first put this in perspective. Having the 5G network is about having the edges included. 
So the telcos will not walk away from the edges because we own the end-to-end network. So it's not only the wireless, but the fixed part of the network that we own as well. So the edge can, uh, of course, when we place it, uh, when everybody talks about how, how good is it going to be, how better the latency is going to be. And I think it goes back to what Hira said, it's about the applications that you will be using. So not everybody will be requiring the edge, but they can take advantage and benefit of the edge. Uh, and this comes also to the question of distributed clouds as well. Uh, so how we work with the hyperscalers, uh, whether it is, you know, they have, uh, you know, AWS has Wavelength, for example, uh, you could w- partner with them and work together, or you can still build your own. For example, at Docomo, we've built our own edge cloud uh, called the Docomo Open Innovation Cloud. Uh, we have uh, various customers already using this, and we have over 100 customers, clients using this edge and running their uh, applications, especially with video streaming and XR services. So to answer your question, the telcos will not walk away. At least Docomo would not. Uh, but at the same time, we will find ways to partner and work together with our, you know, whether it's the hyperscalers or with our uh, solution partners uh, to work together with them to deliver the services at the edge. And we can place the edge, whether it's at the base station uh, and whether it's closer to the network equipment, the core network. For us, we've put it at our core. The edge sits right at the core. So this provides high security and we can also build upon and customize the network as it was mentioned earlier with the network slicing as well. So now we will have full control over this and going back to what Constantine said, we can now provide value for this as well. We can charge for these services and we can put a premium for that. And that comes coupled with the solutions naturally. So that's why we work and have this 5G open partner program whereby we have over 4,000, over 4,500 partners who are part of this monetization engine. So going forward, the edge will be owned by telcos, by the hyperscalers, and also by the solution providers as well. And I think we'll have a good mix of that going forward. No, that's, that's I mean, that, 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 that all resonates with me as well, but I have to think coming from Hong Kong, and I, and I think uh, uh, Vishnu can probably comment on this from, uh, from a Singapore point of view, does, does an edge really exist in, in smaller countries? Are we only talking about edge when it comes to, to large countries? Because primarily it's all about low latency, but in, in a place like Singapore or Hong Kong, you can get low, low latency just from the, the data center that you have. What do you think, Vishnu? I think, I think uh, you're spot on, Paul. It depends a lot on the country. I can, I can talk about you know, a, a POC I'm doing with a client at this point of time where we were trying to look at creating a low latency connect to the public cloud. And uh, when we started the project, you know, uh, the plan was to move it to Amazon Direct Connect sort of uh, interface. But what we figured out is that, you know, even without that, we're getting a four milliseconds latency, you know, just by uh, having it terminate on the pop in Singapore for Amazon. So, you know, in a a country like Singapore, uh, it's a bit fluid. But what I do feel is that over a period of time, we're going to get into a phase where, uh, you know, you call you can call it the edge stabilization phase, you know, where you will know where this edge is stabilizing. Is it on the device? Is it on the, is it, is it on a mech under the tower? Is it a mech, you know, uh, at a, uh, uh, at a place which is co-hosted with a core or is it, you know, a far edge, you know, somewhere in the cloud. So it's only time which will probably, uh, you know, lead to stabilization of the edge uh, somewhere. But what we see from a customer point of view, and, and, you know, if I, uh, jog back our memories to, uh, you know, where we are right now, people really don't ask you today, you know, are you on 4G or are you on 3G? You consume the service. Similarly, you know, uh, I think the time has gone where you start looking at, you know, am I hosted on the public cloud or is it a private cloud or is it your data center? Nobody asks about it from a enterprise perspective, from a customer perspective. I think what's important is how do you orchestrate the quality of service which you are delivering and the edge can be anywhere then the question remains you know how do you make it economical to host the edge you know at a point which is which is most 
economical for the customer delivering the same quality of service. So, so that's why you know a lot of companies may start off with services which are on premise, move you know, and you know they they could even move it to a telco edge because guess what you know they find it easier to manage and cheaper at the telco edge yet the same quality of service and and in the future it could even move to the far edge. So, so you know uh, it, it'll take some time to realize you know which edge is probably the best for which uh, kind of an application and maybe the applications which you know are uh, probably natively built for 5g those don't even exist yet because you know while we are trying to retrofit a lot of technologies like i'll give an example from my daily life we we talk to a lot of companies who are putting in agvs now if you look at most agvs they're built for safety they're meant for security not for productivity no agv is as productive as a human that's because it's meant for safety and that's where 5g can you know actually uh, give it an edge but how many agv manufacturers have yet you know to offload their compute from the agv onto the edge that's not yet happening so uh, you know until the equipment universe matures enough we will really not know you know where the edge should be until then we'll keep experimenting with it yeah it's it's, it's still not a mature area is it we keep talking about it but it's, it's a fair way off before we can start to really uh, deploy it easily um i was going to shift a little bit and move towards the, the private and, and enterprise 5g now and uh uh, Con Constantine, uh, I, I know that you've um, you've been involved in in some of these areas of uh, of network slicing. That and w where where do you see automation going in the private or enterprise networks? Uh, um, do you think it'll extend to customers being able to do the self service orchestration and even to create and manage network slices and enable the extension of QoS across uh, even global networks into in, even into the wireless networks? I do eventually will get there. I believe that, uh, you know, the concept of network slicing and the approach we're taking at Juniper is to, to look, um, you know, at, at a slice as an Uber tenant, right? Where you, you, you know, I use, I often use the uh, analogy of uh, an MVNO, you know, take, um, you know, entity Docomo. Uh, I won't be able to enable entity Docomo to onboard an MVNO yet to give them you know, the ability to further sub-slice their own slices, all on a shared infrastructure, right? You don't want to dedicate resources. Um, you want to use the same you know, access point and yet uh, use statistical multiplexing to, to, to enable strong SLA uh, across multiple tenants and across slices within a tenant. Um, we have a ways to go to deliver that. Um, I, I feel pretty strongly about this being a transformational, not just for 5G, but across all networking, right? We'll see enterprises, we'll see hyperscalers adopt this kind of models. Uh, and uh, of course, automation there is going to be critical. So we are, at, I, I think, at, at the beginning of this uh, journey. Um, and, and I'm proud to say that at Juniper, we, we can demonstrate, you know, limited use cases of that sort of uh, extreme automation. Uh, but uh, I think it's a one-way um, avenue. Thanks, 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 Constantine. Um, Zaif, do you think these capabilities, capabilities in 5G, especially ultra-reliable, low-latency network slicing with QoS, will, will enable um, things like carved out yeah. emergency services networks for governments and finally replace all the old uh, Tetra-style mobile radio for, for police and ambulance and fire services? You know, are you finding the, the, the local emergency services where, where you are responsive to this idea? Thanks, Paul. Uh, well, I, you see, this is something, uh, it, it's, it's a choice of the network, I would say. And also, uh, as I think uh, Vishnu mentioned earlier, uh, this comes with a cost. So uh, if we can replace and find uh, better ways of the usage of the 5G network or the PSAPs, for example, and if they find that that can actually save more lives, create better cities, uh, create more security, naturally uh, that will be the that will be the trend going forward. But I think with the availability of the cheap radio that they currently have in place, and with the wide coverage that it will be required, uh, it it may not happen too soon. But I think uh, it can happen in maybe like focused areas of certain, for example, if you want to call it like gated cities, uh, whereby you want to create a certain area uh, which utilizes uh, the features of 5G and they can maybe use it in some uh, government specific areas. 
uh, maybe it could be used in, for example, uh, like the self-defense or the, the, the Ministry of Defense, for example. In Japan, they call it the self-defense. They don't have a military here, so they call it the self-defense force. So the thing is, uh, it would be used, I think, in those areas first, probably. And as uh, the cost becomes cheaper, uh, because it is something that will be available probably to the wider uh, you know, nationwide usage, uh, it may take some time to deliver that. But I think in terms of the capabilities that are provided with the network, uh, naturally, with the current uh, infrastructure they have, with the implementation of the new infrastructure with 5G and the, the network slicing and the different types of use cases that could come up with the uh, features of 5G, uh, then they will come up with new types of uh, services. Uh, it could be probably maybe interactive uh, with the end user, which is, may not be just within the PSAPs, but the person who is in help of, who is in need of that help can access maybe from their mobile phone and be uh, connected to their network to let them know what kind of emergency or what kind of situations they are in, whether it be robbery or anything. I, I think Constantine has something to say there. Well, actually, um, we've got three minutes left, and I've got a couple of questions that have come in from the uh, from the audience, which are quite interesting. Um, I'll keep them both as open ones, so feel free to pitch in. But uh, it's a pretty open question. The first one from Robert Curran: When do you expect operators to launch network slices on public networks? I think that's a big one. Anyone? Well, I'm on the optimistic yeah. side. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, <laughs> uh, I was, I was going to say that, you know, we do have, uh, you know, at, at Singtel, we, we do have network slices available, except that they're not currently dynamically, uh, uh, you know, created. We do have static slices, uh, which are on the public network. But, uh, you know, we see another one, one and a half years before uh, we can actually have a service orchestrator capable of creating uh, dynamic slices. It also needs the uh, 3GPP, uh, you know, release to be adopted. So there is there is still about a year, year and a half before that happens, at least with Sector. Any advance on that from anyone else? No? Okay. The, the other question, which is a bit off the wall, so it, it can be a very short answer from you all, but uh, I guess it's, it's something that's been in the press over the last couple of days and, that, and it's got nothing to do with the topic, uh, I think, that we've been covering, but uh, would the launch of satellite internet systems be a threat to 5G services? Actually, no. I don't think so. Yeah. That's the short answer. <laughs> uh, it, no it, it's not threat. No th it's complementary. It's complementary yeah. in the yes. in the maritime world, which today you know is a black box for me. I'm actually able to create and curate better services by having seamless connectivity across the ocean by harvesting you know uh, services which are satellite based. It makes it better for us, to be honest. I, I like and it. I, think I like the complementary view. So, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so and I think, I think uh, for... maybe made available to the people which are not connected yet. And they will be able to have at least high-speed internet connectivity to uncovered areas. And as as you know, fellow panelists have said, it's a complement to 4G or 5G or any 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 medium of common uh, communication and connectivity is welcome. Good. Well, um, just uh, almost up now, so I'd, I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank everybody for coming on this morning and give us their views. 30 minutes is a very short space of time to, uh, to get through the questions and answers, but I think we've covered them quite well. And, uh, um, well, I, I guess I'll pass it back to Roy now because I think we're, uh, we're pretty well done. So once again, thanks to Constantine, thanks to Hira, thanks to Vishnu, and thanks to Zaif uh, for their, their contributions this morning. And uh, I'll get back to bed. <laughs> it's Thank you, Paul. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much, Cheers, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye. All right. Well, well, thank you, Paul, and thank you, panelists, uh, for all your contributions and your perspectives on, on the edge, on slicing, and on uh, LEOs, right? Low Earth orbit satellites as well. So 